One of the more interesting aspects of the restoration here in Kirtland was the formation of what was, became known as the United Firm. It basically consisted of church leaders who band together under the command of the Lord to set up a corporation that would run church-owned properties and businesses. Kirtland, Ohio is an excellent place to be able to understand that early United Firm. It included basically uh, one central location of the Newell K. Whitney store located behind me. In addition, it included a tannery that uh, was later overseen by Sidney Rigdon, an ashery. It's of interest that each of those buildings now uh, located here in Kirtland, Ohio, are mentioned in Revelation, or at least uh, they're alluded to in the sites that are there. For example, in section 104 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord said the following, Now verily I say unto you concerning the properties of the order, referring to the united firm. Let my servant Sidney Rigdon have appointed unto him the place where he now resides and the lot of the tannery for his stewardship. In addition, the Lord referred to Neil K. Whitney's properties. He said again, Let my servant Neil K. Whitney have appointed unto him the houses and lot where he now resides and the lot and building on which the mercantile establishment stands, which would refer to the Newell K. Whitney store. Also the lot on which is on the corner of the south of the mercantile establishment, which would be to my left, and also the lot on which the ashery is situated. And all this I've appointed unto my servant Newell K. Whitney for his stewardship, for a blessing upon him and his seed after him, for the benefit of the mercantile establishment of my order, which I have established for my stake in the land of Kirtland. Now in a sense, the church still follows the pattern that we see here in the Newell K. Whitney store. In a way, after the consecration, when this becomes Newell K. Whitney's stewardship, this becomes in a sense the for-profit uh, business side of the church. In a minute, we'll see the not-for-profit uh, welfare side of the church. But here, um, we see a situation where we have individuals like Newell K. Whitney who have the resources to be able to bless many, many church members, maybe all church members in a sense. Uh, you have a store where the capital expenditure required was really beyond what most families financial capacity was. We see the same thing as the church is established out in Utah with the Utah Railway, Utah and Idaho Sugar, uh, power companies, uh, etc. There is no doubt that the for-profit side of the church also uh, was passed into and became part of the sacred treasury of the kingdom. In fact, it was received as a stewardship. The individuals recognized they didn't own the property but they were stewards over the property. And so that as the, this for-profit or money-making uh, business side of the church expanded, the Lord revealed that the stewards were to establish what he called another treasury uh, to deposit profits derived from the various stewardships. Uh, this treasury described in the Revelations is in contrast to the sacred treasury which at that time was for funds specifically derived from and, and used for publishing sacred scripture. The profits from the church-owned businesses could be utilized for commercial and community development. Uh, we've seen that most recently uh, due to what began here in, in Kirtland in the Newell K. Whitney store in the City Creek development in Salt Lake City. It's probably been one of the largest. Is All of the funds that were used in those type of developments come from the treasury which is entirely funded through these for-profit businesses. They do not come from tithing funds or fast offering funds or donations for missionary or temple work or even humanitarian aid. And so the Lord early in the revelations determines we're going to have these two treasuries. And we have moved forward from that very time. The miracle is these treasuries and the uh, establishment of the mercantile end of the church began so early in the 1830s here. One of the more challenging revelations for students of the Doctrine and Covenants involves a tannery that stood on this site behind me. It's section 104 of the Doctrine and Covenants that refers to the disillusion of what was known as the United Firm. 
And now verily I say unto you concerning the properties of the order, referring to this firm. Let my servant Sidney Rigdon have appointed unto him the place where he now resides and the lot of the tannery for his stewardship. The tannery was a large operation that included a building, vats, bark grinder, and other elements that were all on this property. Tanning consists of taking the hides of animals and converting them into usable leather. They do so by putting into vats of tannic acid and then making it pliable so you use it for clothing and for shoes. Sidney Rigdon had entered into the tanning business during a short period of time when he had left uh, his appointment as a Protestant minister and so he could oversee these, this program as a holding the stewardship but he actually gave the day-to-day -day running of the tannery to other individuals. Perhaps equal in importance to the Neil K. Whitney store and the building of the Kingdom of God economically is the ashery. Therefore, it's worthy of closer examination. Hey. Often a farmer's first cash crop came from clearing his land of the trees that occupied it. He'd either sell those trees for lumber or he could burn them to ash and bring them to an ashery. Newell K. Whitney owned an ashery in Kirtland, Ohio. At first it was a small building, but as the business expanded, he built a, a larger uh, ashery that was about 60 feet long and 20 feet wide is shown in this reconstruction of the Newell K. Whitney Ashery. He bought the ashes for several cents a bushel, but to turn that ash into potash required specialized equipment. And some of that equipment we see right here. This large water barrel, uh, water was pumped up through a pipe and into the barrel. You can see a bung here that could be opened or closed. The ashes would be dumped, of course, into these large bins. As the water came down the trough, this bung could be removed, and the water would actually leach out a caustic lye that would be collected and gathered into cauldrons. The lye mixture was gathered and placed in these large kettles where it would be boiled down to potash and then it could be sold to those that manufactured alum, saltpeter, glass, soap, leather goods, gunpowder and paper, and in cotton and wool processing facilities as far away as England. Further heating resulted in a more fine form of potassium called pearl ash. Pearl ash was created by taking the potash and putting it into a much higher heat oven and then over time, out came uh, a much lighter colored and more refined form of potassium. Pearl ash was used in creating porcelain. When the ashery was enlarged, an office was added so that Orson Hyde could uh, take care of his business responsibilities in here. He had some responsibility for quality control, making sure that all of the products that left the ashery were, uh, were of the quality that they needed to be. And of course, he kept records of uh, the comings and goings and the business dealings of the ashery. The ashery is a reminder of the spirit of consecration that inspired the Whitney family in dedicating their lives to the building of the kingdom of God. They took the, the pot ash and the pearl ash and placed it in large barrels that then could be shipped to those that wished to purchase them. The monies from the ashery were used to finance much of the kingdom here in Kirtland, Ohio. The first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants published in 1835 and the second edition of the Book of Mormon were financed from the monies of the ashery. In addition, the building of the Kirtland Temple and much of the financing of the missionary labors came from that which was produced here in this ashery.